from the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., Call on Congress. The program discussing national issues that affect Oklahoma. Your host, U.S. Representative Tom Cole. Thank you for joining me today for another episode of Cole on Congress. Now, today I'm very pleased we have a very respected leader and an Oklahoma nationally recognized expert uh, in law, politics, and public policy. Cleta Mitchell's a former Oklahoma state legislator. We're going to talk about that. A proud Sooner alum. Sooner or later, we're going to talk about the Notre Dame game as well. Uh, she's now partner uh, at the law office of uh, Foley and Lardner and is a member of the uh, uh, political uh, law practice uh, division there. So, I mean, absolutely, you know, I can actually go on and on <laughs> in terms of introductions about you. You've been the chief legal counsel for the National Senatorial Committee. You've been the chief uh, legal counsel for the National Republican Congressional Committee. Thanks to you. Well, no, I, look, I just hire the best talent you can find at the minimal amount of money I could pay. And you were very gracious and did an unbelievable job at Thank both you. those places. I don't know how many members of Congress and campaigns yeah. that you've represented. Uh, and I, I will uh, tell you, and we'll get into the personal part, but I think one of the things people love about working with you that are in this end of the business, the elected uh, end of the business, is you've been there too. Yeah. And so you understand campaigns and you understand what it's like to serve and what the multiple pressures are. And when you were in Oklahoma in the legislature, from, if I remember right, from uh, 74? 76. 76, okay, eight years uh -huh. to, uh, yeah, to uh, 84. And then um, you, I mean, passed landmark legislation, right. the, uh, the Open Meetings Act, that's Correct. something desperately needed. You were the first woman in America, I think, to chair an appropriations right. committee any place. Uh, you know, amazing uh, political background in and of yourself, taught at Harvard. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, is there something you haven't done? <laughs> well, I still haven't broken 80 playing golf. <laughs> I've only broken 90 once. <laughs> you will, though. I'm uh, determined. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, sooner or later, if you just stopped, like, working 80 yes, hours a week true. and could actually play <laughs> golf, Practice. I, have, I have no doubt you'd be very good. But uh, I always like to throw in something personal here, and then we'll get into some of the more controversial things you're doing. But I first got to know you. You were a Democrat at the time, but uh, our, our great friend, the uh, late uh, Jack Edens, used to oh, always yeah. tell me that you'd gone to OU with and was a premier Republican strategist. That, uh, uh, he said, she is a lot more conservative than you think she is, <laughs> and maybe than she knows she is. <laughs> well, I think there is some truth in that the... Uh, as the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And I think that what happened was that I, I really did literally have a moment in, uh, in my life. Uh, we were still living in Oklahoma City, and I remember the time when I sat down and said, now, wait a minute. Uh, at this point, I was married, I had a baby, and I had two stepchildren, and and all of a sudden, I, I start thinking about how you raise kids to be self-sufficient and not dependent, and sometimes it takes some tough love. And I thought, wait a minute, I've got this set of public policy beliefs, you know, which is bleeding hard and all that. And then I know what it takes to raise a child, because my, my mother always taught me. And I thought, these I have public policy beliefs, and then I have personal beliefs. And they don't match. This is what psychologists call uh, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> and I said, they, both, they cannot both be right. And what I realized was that the real life knowledge of what you need to do to really help people, which is to help them be self-sufficient, as we were talking about, about Governor Anatubby and his philosophy governing uh, the Chickasaw tribe, the Chickasaw Nation. That, to me, is my mother's policy writ, about raising kids writ large into public policy. And that's where I think I realized the Democrats had become the party of government rather than the party of uh, the people. The, well, the people. Helping people is the thing that needs to, to happen. To be fair to you, though, I don't think you were ever, quote, a bleeding heart <laughs> liberal. I mean, I'm not sure there's any in Oklahoma, but uh, the Oklahoma Democratic Party of the 70s and 80s was a very different party. Certainly from the National Democratic Party. Yeah, it really party. was. I mean, it's this party of David Bourne, the party right. of Glenn English. Uh, you know, it was very much... Uh, 
uh, a small government, fiscally responsible, strong country. military, strong, strong military, defense. you know, uh, a, a strong presence uh, internationally and uh, pro energy. I mean, I, oh, I think the, right. the path that you walk, honestly, is a path that a lot of Oklahoma. Uh, Democrats walked because their party moved nationally. They right. didn't move. They didn't move to the right or have some dramatic conversion. I do, as you know, a lot of polling or used to. And I can tell you, Oklahomans think today and have the same set of values today that they had when they were voting Democrat. They're just not the same national party. And they eventually, particularly when uh, figures like yourself and like David Boren uh, were no longer there, they just, they, you know, they began looking at their presidents and, and uh, they just couldn't defend it anymore and, and started voting Republican. And all the way up and down the line. Yeah. The courthouse yeah. That, 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 that I think is the amazing transformation that uh, to, uh, it's hard for, I think, young people today to understand how democratic the political infrastructure in Oklahoma was. Well, you were there. Then. I remember we were there the night in Oklahoma City. What was it, 2000 and, uh, 2004? Yeah. When we won uh, the, house, the house for the first time. You know, that was, people don't, they don't realize it's yeah, been very Senate recent. Yeah, Senate in 2008, yeah, you know, for the first recent. time, stayed over 100 years old at that point. Yeah. So it, it, it's an extraordinary shift. And it's a voter, you know, we talk a lot about a voter migrations in a lot of different contexts, and mostly to the disadvantage of Republicans, you know, losing Hispanics. And there's a lot of truth in, in those kind of things. We forget the greatest shift of voters in modern American history has actually been Southern uh, white evangelicals out of the Democratic Party into, and that's created in many ways a Republican majority that it, when I was a kid, if you'd have told me we were going to control the House of Representatives for 16 out of 20 years, I would have said, you're crazy. That, I mean, we hadn't had it uh, you know, in 40 years until 94, so the idea that we've now emerged as really the party of governance is uh, hard to believe. But, uh, you know, again, I'm uh, lapsing, uh, but I got to get in my mom because she when did. I first got to know you, you were the political power in the southern <laughs> end of, of uh, Cleveland County out of Norman, and she was the political yes, power in the northern end uh, out of Moore. And uh, you guys had uh, really, I guess, Indian Hills Road was yes, about the right. dividing that's line. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, you, uh, but you served together in different yeah. parties and became just terrific we admirers came. of one another. Very, your mother was a wonderful, uh, she was like a mother to me in the legislature. There weren't very many women at the time. Right. And um, your mother was such a solid rock and uh, such a lady and such a smart legislator. And I talked to her many times about lots of different things. And, you know, of course, you were her son. You were, you know, that I knew you as, you know, Helen's son. Well, that's the way I'm still known. I'm <laughs> lots of the district. That's all I am. Helen Cole's little boy. I never have any illusions why I win politically. Well, I don't know about him, but his mom. Well, so. she was really something. But there are, I know I've told you this story before, but I remember once she called me over to her desk and she told me, she said, Cleta, you are much too young to wear shoes like that. You need to get some more modern shoes. I had these clunky, comfortable <laughs> shoes, and I still, I still struggle because I just like the most comfortable shoes. But your mother is trying to upgrade my shoe <laughs> selections. And then when my daughter was born, I actually was going through some boxes the other day. Your mom gave me the most beautiful pink knitted little cap and sweater and jacket, uh, little sweater outfit. And, you know, you give away a lot of baby clothes, but I kept that. And uh, my daughter's getting married next year, and I'm hoping that uh, when I have a granddaughter that I'm going to be able to give that to her from your mom. Oh, that's, uh, that's very special. Thank you. We could go on memories, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the entire show. And uh, But I want to talk to you about uh, a lot of the different work you're doing. First, if you will, just describe in your own words some of the uh, work that uh, you do on a routine basis and things you're involved in. And then let's move to the IRS, okay. which is the hottest topic <laughs> of the day. Well, you know, the thing that I tell people, you, you're supposed to have an elevator speech, you know, 25 words or less, what are you supposed to uh, say? I tell people, well, I'm the conciliary to the vast right-wing conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> I represent conservative and uh, Republican, uh, I represent Republican candidates, number of Republican campaigns, and I represent you. Mm -hmm. I represent uh, Senator Inhofe. Uh, I've done some work for Senator Coburn. I represent a number of uh, Republican Senate senators. I represent their campaigns, and then 
uh, end up representing them after they're elected and uh, represent a number of House members, helping them with ethics, uh, just issues that arise. Yeah, it's it's uh, better to hire a lawyer and stay out of trouble. <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can testify. <laughs> and then uh, a number, I represented a number of party Republican Party committees over the years. And then I represent a lot of issue organizations as well. And that's really what got me into the IRS situation because people will come to me and they will say, um, all right, we want to be involved in X. Maybe there's an issue they want to promote. Maybe there's, a, there's some activity in which they want to be involved, whether it's voter registration or voter integrity and you know, training people to be poll watchers and how do you do that. And you know, in this country, in the real life world of America, uh, not the black market, I don't know how people function, but if you want to open a bank account in America, you have to have a number. And you get that number from the IRS. Now, you and I have a bank account, and we open it with our Social Security number. Right. But if you're not a real-life person, you are an artificial entity of some kind, you have to get from the IRS an employer ID number. And you have to tell the IRS, this is what kind of entity it is. So I listen to people, and they say, this is what we want to do. And I say, well, if you want to do this, then here's how you should be structured. And so that's one of the things that I've been doing for a number of years and have applied for. These are usually not-for-profit organizations. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, when you apply for tax exemption with the IRS, all that means is that the organization does not pay taxes on the income it receives from contributions. It pays a lot of other taxes, but you don't pay taxes if, if somebody gives you a contribution, you don't pay taxes on that income. That's all that means. And um, so I've been doing that for a number of years where I help people. This is the IRS slot <laughs> that you fit into. So there's a paperwork trail that you have to produce and send to the IRS in order to qualify to be in that slot. Well, you've represented a number of entities. I think nine was the number I'd heard that had clearly been targeted uh, by the IRS. Explain, uh, if you will, Number one, what targeting means and how they started coming to you and how this you begin to understand what was going on. Well, as I said, when people come to me and they say, well, we want to do X. So if they want to engage in um, just educational kinds of things, they want to educate the people about how important it is to have a strong national defense. Uh, so I will say, are you going to do any lobbying? Not really. We're just going to, you know, we just want to support the military. Okay, well then, are you going to do any political activity? Not really. Okay, well you fit here as a 501c3 charitable and educational organization. And then if you want to do lobbying, oh, we want to really organize people to call their members of Congress. I had an organization that came to me in the summer of 09, and they wanted to lobby against Obamacare. That's all they wanted to do. That's really all they'd done. Actually, they lobbied also to extend the Bush tax cuts back in uh, 2010, I guess. But God bless them. Yeah. Got most of that done. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> and um, so they would fi file, we filed for them for as a 501c4 lobbying organization, grassroots lobbying organization. So what began to happen was usually it would take between three to five weeks, maybe two months max, to get a 501c4 letter. Okay, the IRS has recognized us as a 501c4. It really was not heavy lifting. You would, there's an application that's posted on the IRS website that's many, many pages, and there are instructions, and it tells you what to say and what they ask you a ton of questions, and you fill that out. You submit all these documents that they request. You pay a, a fee. Of course. So what I began to realize was, wait a minute. We filed that application for this one group in October of 2009. All they've ever done is lobby on Obamacare. The IRS cashed our check. I don't hear anything from the IRS at all until June of 2010. And then they want all of the ads that the group has run against Obamacare. And now this is a group that's done no political activity. So we gather that, we, I send it in. I don't hear anything again for a year later. Now I'm used to three to five weeks. Yeah. Now we're into two years. And, what, and that begins to repeat itself over and over with other groups a uh, group that wanted to uh, just organize to host training sessions for members of Congress after 2010 to uh, study the Constitution. What is the, con you know, that they would bring in speakers, use materials, file in March of 2011, hear nothing, hear nothing. And I began to write letters. And one of the things that I did was when, uh, 
I mean, this one group that had applied in 2009 and wanted all of our Obamacare mm -hmm. ads, that was never, I never got a letter from Cincinnati. It was always from Washington. So I keep, so these things are stacking up. It's like a, you know, it's like the, at, at the airport, you're on the plane ready to take off and you see the line of planes that are just, they're just there on the runway. Nothing's happening. And so I started writing the IRS. I started calling the IRS. And then fast forward to the spring of 2012. And all of a sudden, all my clients get these letters from the IRS with 60, 70 questions. The kinds of questions, I mean, I've never seen anything like this. They bear no relationship to the application. They're, who are your board members? What, what have your board members done with other organizations? What other organizations are you affiliated with? Who are your donors? Who attends your meetings? Uh, do you have minutes of all the meetings? Well, I had one group out of Houston and they would have live web uh, events every Monday night. Mm -hmm. And people would come to this warehouse and they had this makeshift studio. Someone had donated some equipment and they talked about issues. They were educating people, citizens coming together to learn about the issues. And that's when I said, you know what? There's something going on here. And then I find out that there are 80, 90, 100 groups across the country who've gotten the same letter as my clients. So I package these up and I go over and I meet with Senate Finance Committee staff and I meet with House Ways and Means Oversight staff and I say something is going on at the IRS. This is not normal. This I've been doing this for decades and now all of a sudden since 2009, 2010, everything stopped for all my clients and now I find out all the Tea Party groups and then groups that are studying the Constitution, and then a group that wants to promote voter integrity, something's going on. So I knew something was going on. And when Lois Lerner announced in that ham-handed way in February, in May of this Before year. Before the Inspector General's report that the began next to expose week. some of and this. And she was the head of this division right. of the exempt organizations at the IRS. And she announces, and I, I go to a group, this reminds me of something you would do. I go every month to a bipartisan group of attorneys here in Washington. We represent some of us conservative groups and, and Republican candidates. Some represent uh, liberal groups and Democratic candidates. And I started going more than a year ago to them saying, is anybody else getting these letters? And none of the Democratic liberal law lawyers had gotten those. And then I have another client whose IRS uh, filings are released to their political opponents, which is illegal, and their donor list. And so, you know, I knew, and so these people that uh, I meet with once a month, probably who thought I was making this up, except that I took the letters, redacted, and told, <laughs> said, look, these are, this is for real. They all started emailing me. I was out of town, and they started emailing me saying about the, they, many of them were there mm -hmm. at the meeting of lawyers when Lois Lerner made this announcement that, oh, we've discovered this, and it was two rogue employees in Cincinnati, and we're so sorry. And so they all started emailing me, and I was so angry. I sat down and wrote a letter that day to Lois Lerner and Stephen Miller, and I said, do not issue an apology issue my clients letters of determination of exempt status. I'll send you the list and don't tell the American people this was two rogue employees in Cincinnati because I've been dealing with Washington on this for three years. So, and of course now we know, we're, we learn more and more. Of course they're stonewalling, but she was in the big middle of it and so were others. Why don't you lay out, if you would, for our viewers and listeners, exactly what, in your opinion, having looked at this represented clients, what do we know about what the IRS did and, uh, you know, where would responsibility lie for the kinds of decisions that were made? Well, I think uh, if, if people want to really drill down on, on seeing this, uh, I think that from, well, here's what we know. We know that uh, there were letters from Democratic members of Congress to the IRS demanding that the IRS do something about the Tea Party organizations. And we know that there, was, there were constant calls from the White House, including from the President, attacking uh, by name conservative organizations who were challenging him and fighting him on things like Obamacare and all the other things he comes up with. 
And so he was calling on, you know, th these people use government agencies to attack their political opponents. So you have these people who are elected officials, the president, members of Congress, calling on the IRS to do something. And what we know is that the first case, this is in Congressman Issa's uh, interim report that he, his uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform issued about two weeks ago. They've conducted a number of uh, hearings uh, reviewing documents, interviews with IRS employees, and they've started with the low-level uh, IRS employees to try to work their way up. And what they said in this uh, report, this interim report, is that those calls on the I to the IRS to do something, were they, they did not go unheeded. And that these IRS agents said, oh, well maybe when they start looking at these applications, maybe we do need to do something. So they sent, they, ta they flagged them. And they flagged the first one, first couple, and these test cases, and assigned them to a senior IRS official who reviewed the, the test cases. And he said, this 501c4 should be approved, and the 501c3 should not be approved because they say they're going to do political activity, and you can't do any political activity when you're C3. And some of these groups, they just, they didn't know what they should be. They didn't have accountants and lawyers right. and all. And so he recommended that, you know, just business as usual, go ahead and approve this, don't approve this, use the same standards. It came to Washington and they stopped it. And then they asked him for more test cases. And then they start, then Washington starts, and there was a, a report published a couple of weeks ago in USA Today that was a leaked document from the IRS that showed that in November 2011 that wa the Washington office of the IRS had put together a a sensitive case report that had 162 organizations on it, 85% uh, of them conservative. There were a few liberal groups on there, but they got their approval and the conservatives did not. So this all began to just be uh, completely frozen. These applications were frozen now in I Washington. I know during the time when this was happening, that there were a number of Republican members that were having groups come to them yes. and tell them that yes. these things are occurring. And they would put in official inquiries to the IRS, uh, and indeed questions were asked at the committee level to the appropriate officials, and uh, it was just a stark denial. Well, that is one of the most, most disturbing things. That, and here's what we know about that. You are correct. When people like me went to members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, and who wrote letters saying, what's going on there? Are you targeting conservative groups? And there was a hearing in March of 2012, right after all these horrible, invasive, intrusive questionnaires went out to all these hundreds and hundreds of, of conservative groups. And, and the commissioner of the IRS was asked point blank, are you targeting conservative organizations? And he said, no, none of that is going on. And what we know now is that the people in his office, whether he knew exactly that day, but he knew within weeks that that was incorrect, that was false testimony, which is illegal, punishable by perjury and criminal, criminal prosecution. But he and Stephen Miller and Lois Lerner continued to lie to Congress for another year until that TICTA report came out and they couldn't hide behind it. But I know for a fact, because I've heard it from people who worked there in the executive office as the commissioner during 2012, that they knew that the testimony was false and they took no steps to correct it. Let me ask you, um, explain to uh, folks how this inspector general report figures into this, how did it start, what did they find, and... Well, when these letters kept going to the uh, IRS from members of Congress saying, we think there's targeting going on, something is going on. So TIGTA, which is the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, it is the, it is the Inspector General watchdog for the Treasury Department. Of course, the IRS is uh, a division of the Treasury Department. And so TIGTA said, well, we have to open an inquiry. Now, they didn't open a full-scale investigation or audit. It's unclear exactly because it was not, interestingly enough, this report was not very thorough. 
And even they scratched the surface and found all this stuff. Right. So it wasn't very. But what they did was they started interviewing uh, the people in the exempt organizations unit, both in Cincinnati and in D.C. Now, Lois Lerner had her assistant or one of her key deputies sit in on every interview. And TIGTA, the investigators, let her do that. So you've got people sitting there with their boss's representative in the room, but notwithstanding that, they did conclude that, um, yes, that indeed conservative organizations had been treated differentially, targeted, and, and their applications upheld, held up for, but in, in limbo, I mean, honestly, a, a number of groups, many, many groups still don't have their letters. And I have two clients who've gotten even another round of letters. <laughs> well, we're, we don't have a lot of time left, but I want you to give an, your assessment of what's happened to the individuals involved uh, and where are we now and going forward, what do you think are the likely things to occur? Well, Lois Lerner has now retired. She's been allowed to retire. Uh, I represent two different organizations, uh, one which we filed suit in May, um, True the Vote, which is a voter integrity group. And our goal is we sued the IRS, and we've sued all these individuals uh, personally. As, and our hope, of course, the government's filed motions to dismiss. We're, we'll brief that and argue that the first part of next year. And we hope that we can get to discovery so that we can release information about uh, how this happened and hold these people responsible. And then uh, we're filing suit on behalf of the National Organization for Marriage, and that's the group where somebody inside the IRS released the National Organization for Marriage's confidential donor list to its... What a dangerous, subversive group. <laughs> well, they, you know, the Human Rights Campaign believes that it is, and that's who got... They gave our donor list to the Human Rights Campaign. Let me ask you this. Um, in terms of, uh, there's been a lot of congressional activity here. How would you rate what Congress's role has been, particularly Chairman Issa's committee? What, what kind of work have they done? If you had to give a quick opinion, because we have a lot you of know, time. You know, look, I mean, I think they've done a great job. The difficulty is, if I had been head queen, I would have appointed a select House committee to combine forces with the Ways and Means and Oversight and Government Reform. Um, and given them the authority, the, the thing that uh, Congressman Issa's committee has been uh, struggling with is that the IRS will only give them documents that are redacted. And so they'll get these hundreds of pages of blank documents. And the IRS has been similarly uh, unhelpful to ways and means oversight. But look, I think the committee staffs, they're working very hard. They are really piecing this together. It is like trying to you know, I think it's like after a plane crash when you're finding pieces here and trying to reassemble the plane. But well, they have found some very interesting things, and I think if we just, there, it's plodding, it's somewhat slow, but they're doing a good job. I would give both of them an A. Yeah, Daryl told me once, he said, we were talking about this, and he said, Tom, so many scandals, so little time. Well, that's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth. This administration, and I, I will say this, this is not just the IRS, but as a principle, we, are in, we all grow up seeing we're a nation of laws, not of men. And the rule of law is fundamental to our society. And this administration, this Obama administration, departs from the rule of law in so many ways. But this is what happens when an agency of the government departs from the rule of law. We're going to have to stop at that point. I'm going to have to have you back <laughs> again. That's the perfect point. But just you're always in the forefront of so many great causes and uh, just thank you for what you do thank you, you, you really have it. what a remarkable career and thank you. Uh, uh, the best is yet to come thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you appreciate Thanks it for thank being you for having here. me you bet. Thank, thank you, you.